President Trump. Well, Steve Bannon still can play a really important role getting the message out on the priorities that he was fighting for on behalf of the president uh, that still need to be done for the American people. Uh, getting tax reform over the finish line over these next few months is key. He could play a part of that. Uh, Steve Bannon was someone, uh, spent time with him, he would be passionately speaking about combating uh, the BDS movement. He's pro-Israel. Uh, he talks about how we could go in a better direction with the Iran nuclear deal, uh, or we could be negotiating better trade policies. Even though he's moving on, uh, he still can play an important role talking about those issues. Uh, within the White House, uh, you need to have uh, the best possible effort uh, on all parts. Uh, led by a four-star Marine General to be able to deliver not just for a president, but more importantly for the American people. I, I don't believe that the Trump presidency is over by a long shot. Uh, this president has a lot of big wins already under his belt, confirming Neil Gorsuch, signing dozens of bills, keeping Americans safe from an attack, an economy that is growing, uh, and he's just going to keep on racking up big wins. And, and for those who want to uh, you know, say that he hasn't accomplished anything or he won't accomplish anything, they're dead wrong and the president's going to prove, prove, prove them wrong uh, day after day with the weeks that are ahead. Well, you talked about some of the things that Steve Bannon was fighting for. We know that he was an economic nationalist, things like uh, trade, build the wall, uh, America first. Do those priorities change at all for this administration with his exit? Well, no, because Steve Bannon happens to be someone whose priorities, in many respects, were most in line with President Trump's priorities. Uh, President Trump isn't going to stop fighting for securing our border and building a wall. Uh, he's not going to, to stop fighting for a better path forward on negotiating trade deals with other countries, trade deals that are best for the American economy, American workers most importantly. Uh, so I believe because there was so much symmetry on their priorities of fighting for the American people, the priorities that got President Trump elected last November, uh, that the president's going to keep fighting for it. And there are a lot of people who agree with President Trump uh, on these priorities are going to help get it across the finish line, both inside the West Wing and out. And Congressman, switching gears, you have been catching some heat uh, for supporting what President Trump said in the sense that, you know, there's both, there are violent sides, uh, different violent sides there in Charlottesville. Uh, Virginia, do you, do you worry, you know, there's been universal condemnation, as there should be, uh, for the members of the KKK, these white supremacists, these hor horrific individuals that showed up that day. But do you worry that the left has not condemned some of these other violent groups that we have seen, not just in Charlottesville, but really out throughout the country, groups like Antifa? Is there a concern that the left is not condemning these different groups? Oh, there's a responsibility in order to not be hypocritical for the left to call out all of the elements that are the extreme on their side responsible for violence against people, threats of violence against people. The Missouri state senator a couple days ago threatening and uh, calling for the president's assassination. Uh, those who show up to these protests with violent purposes and intentions. Uh, all of the celebrities uh, on their side of the aisle, uh, Kathy Griffin, Madonna, Johnny Depp, uh, George Clooney, Shakespeare in the Park, Snoop Dogg, all these people who have you know, reenacted killing and harming the President of the United States. The, the left has a responsibility to call that out, just like uh, really all Americans have a responsibility to call out the KKK, anyone who associates with the KKK and Nazism, they are filled with evil, bigotry, intolerance uh, that is un-American, it's unwelcome, it's wrong. Uh, I am here as a Republican willing to condemn any extremist element on our side responsible for all that hate and evil, there's a responsibility on the part of the left not to be hypocritical and to do the same for those in, in their party who will be at a, a, a rally talking about harming our police who keep us safe, uh, protesting so many things that are good about uh, what makes America the greatest country in the world. Uh, that is incredibly important uh, for them to uh, unite this country if they're genuinely interested in being united and, and, and they don't just want to oppose, obstruct, resist this president entirely on everything and, and anything uh, because they say you can't work with this president because if you work with him you'll normalize his presidency. Give me a break. I didn't vote for Barack Obama but he was my president. They may not have voted for Donald Trump but he is their president and they should be rooting for his success because his success as President of the United States is their success as Americans if they get their priorities in order and call out those extremist elements on their side. Well, Congressman, we so appreciate you being here with us tonight. Thank you. And developing you. tonight, police in Spain still on the hunt for the driver in Thursday's terror attack in Barcelona. Joining me now with reaction to the latest news and what it means for us here at home, 
Former CIA counterterrorism officer Buck Sexton and a former Department of Homeland Security consultant Mustafa Tamiz. Thank you both for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Uh, Buck, I want to start with you. So this attack in Spain marks the sixth kind where we've, we've seen a vehicle used in a European nation to cause mass casualties. Is this the new normal in Europe? Well, what's interesting in this case is that it seemed that they were actually trying to build what we would call VBIEDs, Vehicle Borne Improvised Explosive Devices, based on the bomb factory that, that went up and that actually uh, was really, in some ways, the reason for the accelerated attack, uh, attack planning. This was a plan B for them, using the vehicles. Plan A was to use uh, TATP, based on Spanish language reports, which is a homemade explosive that, by the way, is a hallmark of the Islamic State's previous either inspired or directed terrorist attacks in cities like Brussels, uh, in Manchester, uh, in Paris. So there have been a number of high-profile attacks using this explosive, but it is difficult to handle, and if you make a mistake, it can be your last, and that's why the house went up and they decided to go to vehicles instead. So this is a combination of different terror tactics that we've seen in the past, and quite honestly, Lisa, it actually could have been much worse than it was. Well, we also know that ISIS has been pushing out propaganda, encouraging people to use vehicles uh, for these kinds of attacks, sadly. Um, Mustafa, I want to get to you, and I have a question for you. You know, the CIA um, has repeatedly or reportedly warned uh, Spanish officials about an attack like this. Do you have any information on that, or, or can you tell our viewers a little bit more about that? Well, there was a number of, uh, of, of chatter about that there may be potentially attack in this. You know, the, 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 the Spain has been somewhat fortunate in that there was a chariot plot that was thwarted earlier. Uh, there was a lot of intelligence that something could happen there, but so far nothing had occurred. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity uh, coming because of North Africa. But, you know, he, here's the reality that we're all facing. Um, ISIS has put out a call uh, for, for people to, you know, act where they are. And that's been a very danger. We're seeing la radical extremism, uh, you know, for, for people to, to, you know, take these uh, homemade devices uh, like cars and just ram them into people. So th this, is, this is what's dangerous. Uh, what Buck is talking about, uh, now taking it to the next level, just imagine if, if they were able to take this, uh, you know, these propane tanks and we were able to take them into a populated uh, a tourist area, it would have been far, far, far worse. And Mustafa, I also want to ask you just more broadly on ISIS. So we've seen President Trump ask for a comprehensive plan from Secretary Mattis, uh, something that General Jack Keane has said President Obama never did. We've seen some gains in, ISIS, or in Syria and Iraq against ISIS as well. Uh, how do you think President Trump is doing in his fight against ISIS? Look, I think we're making tremendous gains on the ground in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, what we have to really do and we, what we haven't done is how do we fight uh, the, 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 the battle of the ideas. We're, we're not doing enough in counting violent extremism on the net. Uh, we're not taking down enough websites. We're not taking down enough Twitter accounts. We've gotten more cooperation than we ever have on social media. But still to this day, we haven't put together a comprehensive strategy uh, to take down these websites and take down the, the, the YouTube cities. Anwar Awaki, who, who, who we took down uh, with a drone attack years and years ago, his videos to, to, to this day are still being used to, to radicalize youth, uh, not just in Europe, but even within the United States. And we have to do a much better job to do that today. But Buck, is, is taking down these websites, is that enough to combat this ideology? Because we've seen all these groups, whether it's the Taliban, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's ISIS, and they keep sprouting up and they all share the same ideology. So is, is simply just taking down uh, these websites, is that enough? No, it's not enough. And this is a challenge uh, that we've been trying to deal with on the counter-radicalization side for the entirety of the post 9-11 era, uh, we're still finding out a fair amount about these young men, a dozen or so of them in a very large and, and complex terror cell. But at this point, some of the markers that you would expect for radicalization, some of the uh, social media and, and other electronic signatures that you would think you'd see for somebody who had gone through a jihadization process, it's not there. Uh, these individuals, some of them are very young. They were considered to be among peers, uh, well integrated, very westernized. And they weren't, as we've seen in some other attacks, by and large, well known to authorities as extremists. They weren't uh, being watched because it was thought maybe they had returned from training with the Islamic State. So counter-radicalization in this case may involve a preacher that's been reported, somebody who was a visiting preacher. And so you're going to have to try and stop that from happening, uh, which is a very tall order. And quite honestly, up until this point, I think 
Spain and, and some of these European countries have done a pretty good job disrupting plots, but the problem is when one gets through, you have a mass casualty event like this, and there's a lot of other issues that you can bring, in, uh, bring into the discussion right. that I think should happen. I immigration policy is one of them, uh, but counter-radicalization is something that we're going to continue to struggle with, not just for years, but for decades. Right, and Mustafa, real quick, you had mentioned North Africa. How big is ISIS's footprint right now across the world? Well, what, what the, the we can begin to really take them down and, and shrink the ground in, in, in North Africa. I don't think we've done enough, but we can do more. But the, 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 ch the global challenge is, is that we can't shrink their footprint on the Internet. And that's what I was talking about, that we've got to find a much better way to shrink their footprint on the Internet because these communities on the Internet begin to grow very rapidly. Someone on a, on a laptop can do that. The other thing I want to talk about just briefly is that we've seen a lot of radicalization in prisons across Europe. Uh, we've seen these petty criminals that go in for for very minor crimes in Europe and come out hardened, not just criminals, but hardened terrorists. And we have to do a much better job in working through prisons in Europe that we haven't done. We've seen a number of hardened uh, terrorists come out of prisons in Europe that, that I think it's, it's a growing, growing phenomenon. Well, Mustafa Buck, thank you so much for your expertise. We really appreciate it thank tonight. You. A second police officer killed after a violent night in America against her men and women in blue. We're talking about that next. And then more rallies and counter protests in the wake of the Charlottesville violence and all that has sparked a debate over American history. We'll talk about that and so much more with Fox News contributor Colonel Alan West as justice rolls on in just a moment. Don't go away. Breaking tonight, heartbreak in Florida as a second police officer is now dead in Kissimmee after a gunman fired on officers. It was one of three shootings injuring several officers in Florida and Pennsylvania last night. Joining me now to talk about it is Dan Bongino, a former NYPD officer and a former Secret Service agent. Dan, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, so Happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I wish it was under different circumstances, sir. Um, so we saw you know, these shootings just last night. Uh, six police officers shot in Florida and Pennsylvania. Two were killed four injured. We saw two officers killed in the line of duty last weekend. It seems like we're hearing way too many of these stories about police deaths. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's because you are, Lisa, tragically. You know, think about it. Policing, the threat to police officers has grown geometrically. And outside of maybe some modifications in training, the tools they have, Lisa, are the exact same they had 30 and 40 years ago. They have some form of a firearm and an impact weapon, and you drive around in cars. I mean, the, the, the tools are the same, but the threat the threat is far different. You have two things right now that you didn't, you had, but you didn't have to the degree we have now uh, the, that you didn't have 30, 40 years ago. You have the growing threat of soft target terror assaults, which was always a threat, but now has grown again exponentially here. And then you also have a police environment as well, where it's seemingly okay among some groups, not all, but some groups to dehumanize police, say things like pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon, which automatically, I think, instills upon people who are already angry at police police officers a sense that it's okay to assault them and uh, and basically to dehumanize them and treat them as subhumans which is totally unacceptable. Well Dan you talk about those threats and those numbers bear it out as well. You look at 2016 we saw a 56% increase uh, in police officers who were killed in the line of duty. We also saw an increase to the tune of 167% uh, in terms of ambush killings. So you, you talked about the tools and how they need to change. How do we change those tools? What tools do our police officers need so we can avoid statistics like the ones we just saw? Well, uh, it's a great question, and I think for, for the first group, the soft target terror type attacks, and there's no indication that the Kissimmee incident involved this, but this is a big threat, police officers being ambushed by terrorist type groups. What you need to do is you have to be an arsonist, not a fireman here. I use this analogy all the time because it's critical your audience takes this away. Being a fireman and trying to solve the, these problems in the aftermath and break up cells after they've attacked or attacked a police officer or ambushed uh, someone is not going to work anymore. We have to transition to a fully the arsonist type approach where we're starting the fires in advance. And what I mean by that is developing sources in the communities, cultivating those sources. And a lot of police officers are, uh, and police departments are doing this. But we have to really, we need like a Marshall Plan for intelligence nationally at the federal, state, and local level because it works twofold. You don't just get at the guys in the community that are the rabble rousers who are calling for hurting cops, but you also get, if you have really good sourcing, you also get those terror groups and you break those cells up in advance. So we're, again, 
we're not putting out the fires after they've already ambushed a police officer. We can't let that happen. Well, and, and you talked about building relationships in these various communities. How much does the media play into that in, in terms of building some of this distrust? We've seen a lot of coverage um, over various incidents over the past couple of years. So what role uh, does the media have in this? Well, they have a significant role. I mean, they're supposed to be the arbiters of truth. Unfortunately, they become the arbiters of, of, of fraudulent narratives for many of them. You know, not all of them. There's a lot of good sourcing out there. But bad media does the public a huge disservice. And here's why. What the bad media does when they, when they give uh, some kind of an intellectual home safe space to groups like Black Lives Matter and other groups that have said things, and I'm not blaming all of them, but a good swath of them who had said things about police officers, it makes it acceptable to be part of that group and there really isn't a reason in the community then when you hear anything uh, about the police officers and someone who may be associated with a group like this who may intend on doing any, uh, something violent there's no reason then to call that group out because you say oh well, you know what they're getting positive media coverage maybe there's a you know maybe they're not so bad and you know some of these groups are not all but some of them really are and the media has done a huge disservice to the public by not making it culturally unacceptable for that stuff to happen I mean they got invited to the White House Lisa you know I know. And Dan, thank you so much. I, I certainly wish it was under different circumstances, but we appreciate your service and, with you, and you being with us here tonight. Happy to help. And another week of turmoil in the White House, while at the same time President Trump dealing with trying to keep this country safe as terror strikes again overseas. Joining me now to talk about all of it, former GOP congressman and Fox News contributor Colonel Alan West. Colonel, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, we talked a little appreciate bit about this... Thank you. We talked a little bit about this terror attack uh, it, a little bit earlier on in the show. I want to get your thoughts on it. One of the things that we have to understand from a strategic perspective is that we have to deny sanctuary to the global Islamic Jihad wherever it is. It is not just reducing that territorial footprint that you see in Iraq and Syria, but it's also reducing those footprints that we see here within our own countries. And when you look at the European Union and the open borders policy that they have, these terrorists are able to very easily transit back and forth across from England to France to Brussels and now down into Spain. As a matter of fact, one of the concerns is that the van driver of the the uh, vehicular attack may have crossed the border and gone into France, or maybe he had some collusion with individuals from the country of France. So that's one of the key things we have to do, and I do agree with the previous guests. We've got to win that information operations war and not just be defensive, but we have to go on offense against their ideology. So, Colonel, if you were advising the president, what would you advise him to reduce that footprint that you were talking about? I think uh, you have to look at the many different ways that you can put pressure on them. You have the military aspect, but then you also need to have an economic aspect to follow the money and understand where they're getting their resources and support. And when you look at these websites that are out there, we have to start working with these platforms, the social media platforms, to start reducing that footprint there. But then your guest talked about how we have to get into the prisons because you see a rad radicalization process happening in our prisons, as well as some of these imams, clerics, and mullahs who are coming coming into the United States of America, and they're the one preaching this, a lot of this hatred. All you have to do is look at England and see what is happening there. Can you talk about a little bit about, or expand upon a little bit about this problem we're seeing in prisons? with the rad well, radicalization you spoke of? Oh, sure, sure. One of the things that you have to kind of understand is that this uh, violent Islamic jihadism rewards these uh, prisoners and these people that have conducted and, uh, and committed violent crimes for that type of behavior. And so when you start to get into that mindset and say that, you know, you can be rewarded for this violence, when you start to demonize others because of the travails of this individual, uh, that's what you see happening. It's a breeding ground in a lot of the prisons that we see uh, uh, all across the United States of America, as well as across Europe and other places. Well, and Colonel, I want to switch gears with you a little bit. We, we've seen a lot of racial tensions over the past week um, after, in the wake of what happened in Charlottesville, an uh, innocent, innocent woman losing her life. Uh, you know, I want to ask you, there, there seems to be this narrative um, that all of this has started under President Trump, but if you look at Gallup, and you look at polling really over the past three years, uh, they've shown in their polling that we've seen a spike throughout the duration of the past three years. So what would you say about that and why have we seen this continued increase in racial tensions in this country? 
Well, I will go back to the current mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, who once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And so there are people that are always looking for a political advantage to promote their ideological agenda. You know, one of the things I find, Lisa, very oxymoronic is that you have this violent group called Antifa that is out there that says they're against fascists. But yet you saw them taking to the streets at University of California, Berkeley, in a very violent manner to oppose anyone Trump coming to that uh, campus to speak. And when was the last time you saw a conservative uh, individual speak on some of these liberal campuses? And you look at someone like the Black Lives Matter movement who says that they're against the white supremacists. Well, guess what? One of the biggest white supremacists this country has known was a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. And I don't see Black Lives Matter talking about the organization that she founded, Planned Parenthood, which are really in a lot of black communities. And then when you talk about neo-Nazis, well, you have someone by the name of George Soros, who was a Hungarian Jew, who actually worked with the real Nazis during World War II against his own people. But yet they are willing to accept his financing and funding for a lot of these leftist, progressive, socialist uh, endeavors. So I see that there's a, an incredible irony out there on the left when they say that these are the things they stand for. And Colonel, but can, can I, I want to ask you, because you had mentioned uh, Antifa, and so I, I saw, we've, we've seen articles in publications um, across the country. I saw a CNN article, and I'm going to look down and make sure I get this right for you. Uh, and it's titled, Unmask the Left as Antifa Movement, Activists Seeking Peace Through Violence. So do we have the mainstream media uh, basically normalizing these violent groups that you're talking about? Well, you don't, it's not just the mainstream media. It is leaders of the Democrat Party. As Dan Bongino said, Black Lives Matter was invited into the White House. You heard the former Attorney General Loretta Lynch saying that she stood with the resistance movement. The same with Hillary Clinton, the former Democrat uh, candidate for president. So these individuals, like an Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, they're not standing up and speaking out against this. So in a very simple way, they're kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, encouraging this type of very abhorrent behavior. Colonel, we so appreciate you being with us tonight uh, and sharing your expert expertise, if I could talk. Have a great night. Thank you. My our, pleasure, Lisa. Thank you. Our political panel is on deck, ready to duke it out over another tumultuous week in the White House. And later, more insight into the terror attack in Spain and what it can mean for us here at home. How safe are we? We're talking about it as justice rolls on. Stay with us. Welcome back to Justice on this very busy news night. A lot to talk about with my political panel, so let's get right to it. Joining me tonight to battle it out, former speech writer for President George W. Bush, Ned Ryan, and Democratic strategist Don Calloway. Guys, thanks so much for being with us here tonight. Thanks, Lisa. Ned, so thanks I want to having us. What up, Ned? Hey, Don. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, I got to say hi to each other. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, guys. Well, Ned, I'm going to start with you, and I want to start with Steve Bannon. I'm going to show you a quote. I'm sure you've read the article and seen it, but uh, a quote that Steve Bannon gave to the Weekly Standard. He says, the Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over. We still have a huge movement, and we will make something of this Trump presidency, but that presidency is over. So, Ned, what do you think is next for President Trump, and, and does it change the, the dynamics to no longer have Steve Bannon there? Well, of course it changes the dynamics. I mean, I think the thing that Steve Bannon brought to the table was very much the national populist movement and really an emphasis on it. And I think the thing that Bannon was able to do is day in and day out really remind Donald Trump, hey, this is your campaign agenda. This is why you won. It was a winning agenda. And really stay loyal to this agenda. And I think now with Bannon leaving, my concern is a lot of the voices in Bannon's ears, whether they're the neocons or the establishment or the liberal elites, maybe haven't bought into that America first agenda. And while I think President Trump's instincts lean toward that agenda, when you have those voices in your ears, you might tend to drift. And so I think what Bannon is really saying with that quote as well is, listen, please stay true to that agenda. We don't want the traditional Republican administration. Donald Trump was outside the box candidate. He had an outside the box agenda. He has to stay true to that because, again, it was the winning agenda that got him into the White House. Well, and then to that point, uh, you know, there's been a lot of reports about infighting with the White House. As you mentioned, Steve Bannon not necessarily sharing uh, the same ideology as other members of the Trump administration. Do you have any concerns about that infighting being taken outside of the White House? My, my thing is this, and I texted with Steve Bannon this morning and said, Bannon, you know, give me, give me your two quick cents on this. And he said, listen, I want people to know that Steve Bannon and Breitbart have President Trump's back in regards to helping push his populist agenda. 
Now, do I think that Steve Bannon is going to take shots at anyone anywhere that is not true to that America First agenda? Absolutely. Do I think he's going to be pushing it 24-7 and say, hey, again, this is the agenda that was the winning one? 100%. And so I would stress to people listening, I think Bannon has got President Trump's back in regards to pushing that, that populist message. Well, and Don, for, for those on the left, what's your perspective on this change in Bannon's exit? You know, uh, it's really hard for us to say. Uh, Steve Bannon certainly doesn't share the politics of the left, but to me, and I think that to uh, observers on the left, it represents the continued fractured nature and the unruttered ship that is this White House from an ongoing perspective. Uh, he really doesn't have any support, not only on the far left, but in any wing of the Democratic Party. My question, and, and it might not surprise you to know that I didn't text with Steve Bannon like my boy Ned did today, so I don't, I'm not as close to Show this as he text. is. Show me your text. But what does this mean? What does this mean for that far right populist segment? Does the president now lose them? It's one thing for Steve Bannon to say that he has the president back but the question is what does the man and the woman on the street in Indiana in Michigan in Wisconsin who bought into that populist agenda do they now abandon the president as Steve Bannon has drifted out and as the Jared Kushner's might have more influence and then that leaves the president a lot more vulnerable both electorally and from a perspective of being able to push a congressional agenda because his support base which was already wildly unpopular has narrowed even further yeah but but Don I would say this if, if they can go and focus on getting that health care reform done, on getting tax reform done, on getting some infrastructure done, and building a wall, I think a lot of his base will be happy. And so I think what Bannon's going to be doing you, is 24 7 saying three. you got to stay true. If you get those big, t uh, big items uh, passed before 2018 or beginning of 2018, it could be a good year for Republicans. Well, and another issue that's been coming up this week, you guys, talking about the Confederate monuments, and we've seen uh, former Speaker of the House, uh, now Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, talk about this. And, and Donna, question to you. So Nancy Pelosi has been there for 25 years. She was Speaker of the House when the Democratic Party controlled both bodies of Congress, when there was a Democratic president in the White House. So where has she been on this issue when she had the opportunity with both bodies of Congress and a president in the White House? Where was she then on this issue? Well, as you know, the leadership of both parties, uh, regardless of who's in power, moves with the sentiments of the people. Right now, these Confederate monuments and the history of the Confederacy are uh, is a very prescient and relevant conversation right now in the national discussion because of Charlottesville, uh, because of South Carolina and, and the Confederate flags. So, you know, yes, yeah, she's been there all this time, but the conversation has now risen to the, uh, the surface, and she's in a position to speak on it as a leader of the Democratic Party. My personal position is that, sure, it's an issue issue that we should wrestle with. Whether or not we take down monuments wherever they may be found throughout this country, it is good that we're having the discussion and we should ultimately uh, not shy away from the discussion and we should talk about what those monuments really represent and whether or not they have a place in representing who we are today. I would be in favor of taking them get, down, but I, I'm more much just want to have a more serious and adult discussion on the issue and, without calling each other uh, bad names. Right. And, and Don, sorry, we're running out of time. I just want to get Ned mm -hmm. in here real quick on that. So, so Ned, do you buy this about Nancy Pelosi or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm going to be a little cynical and I know Don will find this shocking <laughs> that if it was if it's so reprehensible today why was it reprehensible when she was speaker so again I find myself a little cynical and her trying to score some political points my concern hey. and I think Don shares this a little bit is if we're going to focus on the sins of the past it doesn't allow us to focus on the promise of the future and Lisa, we have so much potential as a nation, again, looking at economic prosperity that is blind in regards right. to race and re in regards well, to gender. Let's focus on that and understand while we've no, not right. been a perfect nation, and that, we I'm have sorry, allowed we, the greatest amount of freedom for the greatest amount of people. And that I, I think we can all agree on that. So we're going to leave that right there. And you guys can text each other and talk about this after the show. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We really appreciate that spirited debate. Thanks, Thank Lisa. you. Thank you all for having us. Thanks, all right. Now. Talking Terror with Fox News contributor and analyst Waleed Ferris next. Don't miss it. More terror overseas and my next guest says everything we see happening in Europe can happen here. Terror analyst and Fox News contributor Dr. Waleed Ferris joins me now. Waleed, how are you? Hello Lisa, thank you for having me. So I, I want to get your thoughts on, on terror, your assessment. How can this happen here? Can we expect this to happen here? I know uh, Secretary Kelly, formerly of the DHS, had said that we are facing a terror threat as high as 9-11. Your thoughts? 
Well, he said that, and let's remember also that the leaders of the FBI and other law enforcement here in the United States have said that there are investigations in all 50 states. That's a lot of jihadists, a lot of potential terrorists. But looking at what happened in Barcelona over the past, and looking at what the Europeans have concluded over the past uh, many strikes in France and the UK and Belgium, there are a network, uh, there is a whole network actually of jihadi cells in Europe. And when I um, exported this idea that this could happen here, it's because the jihadists on both sides of the Atlantic have the same ideology and would have the same analysis as to how to hurt us and attack our civil society. Well, so I want to talk about that ideology because it, it doesn't matter the group, whether it's Taliban, or the, or whether it's the Al-Qaeda, whether it's ISIS, they share that same Islamic radical extremist ideology. So how do we fight and how would you advise the president to fight this ideology? Well, first of all, there is the ideology and then there is the guidance given by the leadership of the various groups, should they be Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or even individual uh, jihadists on both sides of the Atlantic. How to fight the ideology, basically, is to expose it. And to expose it, you have to tell the public, the American public, the international community, what is it about. And that is something that, unfortunately, over the past eight to ten years, uh, leaders in the U.S., a little bit in, in Europe as well, have not been going in that direction. Now it's changing. I think after the statement made by the Prime Minister of Spain three days ago that we are addressing an ideology. What we need to do is more explanation to our public. And second, we need to partner with NGOs from these communities because they are the first line of defense in order to detect these terrorists who are uh, basically in these uh, communities or trying to penetrate these communities. In your assessment right now, how is President Trump and the Trump administration doing in this fight against terror and this fight against ISIS? Well, there are three fronts here. Number one is uh, the, the the statements made by then the the, the of course the, the campaign and of course the, uh, the 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 administration right now about the necessity, the need to confront the ideology. This is a change from the past. Second, the outreach to partners in the region. Remember, the president delivered a very important speech in Riyadh uh, in front of 50 Arab and Muslim leaders, and they decided to work together, including to create a counterterrorism international center in Riyadh. Three, of course, there were the declaration about the vetting systems, about uh, other measures to be taken. The problem is because of our political tension, internal divisions, at least over the past three months, it has been slowed down. So I do call on the president on the one hand, but also on congressional leaders to come together and find common ways, despite all the differences on other issues, to find this national security doctrine. Uh, real quick, how, how do those tensions hurt the president? You talked about the political tensions. Does that hamstring the president and his ability to fight terror? Well, look, for example, we were expecting that Congress will be legislating against a, a number of radical organizations and also the spread of the ideology. It did not happen because right. of, the, uh, of the divide. And many other right. projects that could have helped didn't it, happen. Thank you, Waleed. We thank you, thank you so much for your expertise tonight. Thank you. Conservative commentator and Blaze TV host Lawrence Jones weighs in live on Boston, Charlottesville, and Steve Bannon. Next. More protests today, this time in Boston, after a week of turmoil in the United States. Here with Reaction Blaze TV host Lawrence Jones. Hey, Lawrence, how are you? Hey, Lisa, my friend, how are you? It's good to see you, Lawrence. So I want to get your nice thoughts. You. I, I'm sure you watched the early coverage of the rally today and the counter protest. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think we're at a point in this country where we're divided, and I think this protest was another example of why we're so divided. Um, you have people that are passionate that are on d two different sides on this Confederate flag issue. Um, but what I was thankful to hear was that for the most part the protests uh, were peaceful with the exception of you know a couple groups within the protest that decided they were going to turn things violent and throw things at the police and each other so I'm glad law enforcement had that under control but I do think this is part of the national conversation that we're having across this country I think it's healthy as long as we we, we remain civil well, and Lawrence I, I saw a sign at uh, the event today and it said which side are you on you know, I, th I think we've heard fortunately and thankfully uh, you know, these KKK members, white supremacists last week, sort of been universally condemned right. for their beliefs and their behavior. Uh, do, do you think, are things as divided as, you know, many in the media want us to believe? Do you think we are truly that divided or do you think, you know, there's more that unites us than divides us? 
Well, I think for the most part, Americans are unified on what we uh, identify that is racism and hateful. Um, I, I believe that the majority of us love each other. But I, think that, I do think that the media adds fuel to the fire because there are some things that we disagree with, and race is one of them. Not if we're racist and who is racist, but just the simple things such as the Confederate flag or how people see uh, the, the monuments, uh, that's a contentious issue in many communities. And I think it's healthy to have those conversations and allow communities to decide if they want to keep the monuments or not. But I do think that the media is using this as a political agenda um, to go after the president. And the president didn't do himself any favors uh, pivoting back to his normal talking points uh, during the press conference, or the third press conference conference. And so I think the president does have to take that role of being that leader in, in, in uniting America. And I hope he starts using a language to do that. Well, Lauren, and we've seen a lot of ramped up rhetoric. There's also that Missouri state senator who called for the assassination of the president. And there's also this. There's been magazine covers uh, showing President Trump uh, tying him to the KKK. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think any of that rhetoric is, is helpful to the conversation, especially when you're talking about this Missouri uh, elected official. She should have known better. You don't threaten the president or anyone. Um, and so the fact that we have an elected official doing that, and, and, I, and I've been talking about that uh, from the very beginning. The elected officials and, and, and those in clergy need to take the lead on this. If our political leaders can't sit down and talk civilly without uh, threatening uh, assassination, then how are average day Americans going to do the same thing? The same for the press. Uh,